Hello out there all my bookish friends out there in booktube land and welcome to a June book haul video. We've got seven goodies to look at so without further ado let us dig in shall we? Recently, whilst out for a walk in a delightful little wood that I like to take the children rambling in, my wife happened to say that, did you know there's a bookstore around here? And I said a bookstore because it, it seems to be in the middle of nowhere. The, the only thing close to the woods is an industrial estate. And she said, yes, in one of the industrial units is a bookstore. So of course, without even hesitating for breath, off I dashed to see what good is this bookstore held and lo and behold it was a veritable Aladdin's cave of books in which most of the books are 50 pence a piece and so this month's book haul comes from that place. All I can say is I have found my Graceland. The first book in our book haul for this month is Stoner by John Williams. This is the 2003 Red Spine Vintage uh, collection. Now Stoner is not, as you may imagine, a book about some doobie smoking pothead. In fact, the name Stoner is taken from the protagonist William Stoner, who starts off his life being sent to college by his parents to help them with the farm. So he was going to train in agriculture, but he falls in love with literature. Stoner himself is an unremarkable character. He goes through life sort of not doing anything in particular, it's just the usual humdrum life that the ordinary person lives. When he gets to his death, not many people remember him, he has left little impact on anybody. And yet, despite that sounding a terrible idea for a book, this is a classic which is raved about by anyone who has read it. Because it is just an ode to the common man. It tells the story that is never catalogued in the history books. The history books all focus on the whiz-bang pop fireworks of monarchy, of warfare, of social movements, of superstars and rock stars and all that kind of stuff. This is about an ordinary person who doesn't do anything remarkable but feels as deeply as each one of us. I'll read you the first paragraph. William Stoner entered the University of Missouri as a freshman in the year 1910 at the age of 19. Eight years later, during the height of World War I, he received his Doctor of Philosophy degree and accepted an instructorship at the same university where he taught until his death in 1956. He did not rise above the rank of assistant professor and few students remembered him with any sharpness after they had taken his courses. When he died, his colleagues made a memorial contribution of a medieval manuscript to the university library. This manuscript may still be found in the rare books collection, bearing the inscription, presented to the library of the University of Missouri in memory of William Stoner, Department of English, by his colleagues. And that's the opening paragraph to Stoner. Just to say, on the front here, back in 2003 this was, we have a little badge from the Sunday Times saying, the greatest novel you've never read. I wouldn't say that's quite so true as much anymore, quite a lot of people have discovered Stoner, but it's still a pretty hidden classic amongst the modern classics. So, book number one, Stoner by John Williams. In my newfound Elysium of books, sequestered at the bottom of a crate was this little nugget, by James Joyce, the portrait of an artist as a young man. Now, James Joyce, a bit of an acquired taste, um, but they say about James Joyce that all he ever writes is masterpieces. And I'm looking forward to reading the portrait of the artist as a young man. Um, it, it follows a Catholic boy in Ireland and his struggle through life as he takes on the feelings of sin and of piety and making his way. What Joyce is so good at in his other books, and I haven't read this one, is he gets you tangled up in the motivations of his characters. Um, and there's always 
a feathered edge of perplexity about his work. And this is a very short book, and it's one of those, you know, a few dips in the bath and you can get through it kind of thing. So I'm looking forward to this. If you like James Joyce or you've read this book, leave a comment below about your opinion of him as a writer, whether you find him too hard or too convoluted, or whether you absolutely love the guy. So that's number two. Let's just read the first paragraph. Once upon a time, and a very good time it was, there was a moo cow coming down along the road, and this moo cow that was coming down along the road met a nice little boy named Baby Tuku. And that's how it starts. <laughs> well, I must admit, that's got me piqued with interest. I want to know why on earth you would start the story with a moo cow. Portrait of an artist as a young man, James Joyce. Now in third place is a book that actually right way, way, way back when got me into the classics. And it's a book I used to have in a beautiful bound edition with glorious pictures of pirates and galleons on the front and somehow it went missing. I have no idea where it went to. But then, in this new cave of wonders, I came across the book again, albeit in the rather not so exciting Penguin White Cumberband set. It is Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. Have you read Treasure Island? If you haven't, make it your next read. You might think, oh, it's a children's book. Well, yeah, it is a children's book, but boy, oh boy, what a children's book it is. This is an incredible read. If you want to hold your, if you have children and you want to hold them enthralled, captivated, read them this story at bedtime. It is the most exciting story of pirates. Do you know what? Other than perhaps maybe um, Scaramouche and Captain Blood, who's a little bit more mature, that's by Sabatini, no book comes anywhere near doing justice to pirates than Treasure Island. It will always be the copestone in the pirate genre. It follows, of course, uh, Jim Hawkins and how he, he meets an unusual character called the captain at the beginning. And the captain's always worried about a man with one leg. And he, he has the willies put up him by hearing about this blind man that's turned up as well. And then how Jim Hawkins learns about the treasure map, Treasure Island, and they set sail. And there's that scene in the apple barrel, which you may know, or if you haven't read it, it's a good scene. You must read Treasure Island. This is an essential. How does it open? Squire Trelawney, Dr. Livesey, and the rest of these gentlemen, having asked me to write down the whole particulars about Treasure Island from the beginning to the end, keeping nothing back but the bearings of the island, and that only because there is still treasure not yet lifted, I take up my pen in the year of grace, 17, and go back to the time when my father kept the Admiral Bembo Inn, and the brown old seaman with the sabre cut first took up his lodging under our roof. On that very first page is the famous sea shanty, 15 men on a dead man's chest, yo-ho-ho and a bottle of rum. Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson, a brilliant book. Next up is a book I didn't even know existed, and it's by a writer, Mrs. William Noy Wilkins, called The Slave Son. I know nothing about it. Um, probably the most famous story told about slavery is Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. I'll just read you what the back of this book says. Um, if you've ever read this story, please, please, please leave a comment to tell me what you think. First published in 1854, two years after the huge commercial success which attended Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, The Slave Son is set on the British colonial island of Trinidad in 1832, a year before the abolition of slavery. Wilkins heroine, Laureen, is a mixed-race freed slave working to buy her mother's freedom. She is in love with Balfond, another slave who has escaped from the man to whom her mother belongs, Hilaire Cardon, and who is also Balfon's father. Their pursuit of happiness sets in motion a chain of events from murder to escape and to the chance of a new beginning. The Slave Son is a story of love and hate in a turbulent time when the very conception of justice stood on the brink of change. So that was number four, The Slave Son. Have you read it? Have you even heard of it? 
By the way, if you love classics and want to get more out of reading classic literature by digging into it or finding more hidden gems started there, please hit the subscribe button and smash the like as well because that really does the world of good to the uh, algorithm. Anyway, back to the books. In a previous video where I mentioned Somerset Maugham and I've never read any of Maugham's works, somebody mentioned that they liked The Razor's Edge. So how, how happy do you think I was when I saw it there in a basket? I immediately snatched it up and shall look forward to reading this one. I literally know nothing about the story of this. Um, it just says on the back, Larry Darrell is a young American in search of the absolute. The progress of his spiritual odyssey involves him with some of Mom's most brilliant characters, his fiancée Isabel, whose choice between love and wealth has lifelong repercussions, and Elliot Templeton, her uncle, a classic expatriate snob. The most ambitious of Mom's novels, this is also one in which Mom himself plays a part, as he wanders in and out of the story, observing his characters struggling with their fates. Wow! Now that does sound interesting. A book in which the author toddles in and out. I can't wait to see how he handles that. Also, by the way, we're in the, the early 2000s Red Spine Vintage Classics. I do love the look of these books, don't you? I must collect more of them, get them all stacked up. We'll just read the first paragraph. I have never begun a novel with more misgiving. If I call it a novel, it is only because I don't know what else to call it. I have little story to tell, and I end neither with a death nor a marriage. Death ends all things, and so is the comprehensive conclusion of a story, but marriage finishes it very properly too, and the sophisticated are ill-advised to sneer at what is by convention termed a happy ending. It is a sound instinct of the common people which persuades them that with this all that needs to be said is said. When male and female, after whatever vicissitude you like, are at last brought together, they have fulfilled their biological function and interest passes to the generation that is to come. But I leave my reader in the air. This book consists of my recollections of a man with whom I was thrown into close contact only at long intervals, and I have little knowledge of what happened to him in between. I suppose that by the exercise of invention I could fill the gaps plausibly enough and so make my narrative more coherent. But I have no wish to do that. I only want to set down what I know of my own knowledge. This has just climbed up on my TBR. What a great opening. I am fascinated. I'm captivated by that opening paragraph. So, The Razor's Edge by Somerset Maugham. Our next book is an influential one in history. This book contributed very much to the debate over the abolition of slavery in America, running up to the civil war between the Yankees and Confederates. And that is 12 Years a Slave by Solomon Northup. This is a true story. Um, and I'm ready to sort of have my heartstrings ripped apart reading this. Of course, it's recently been made into a film, hasn't it? Which I haven't seen. Um, if you've seen the film and you've read the book, say in the comments whether you think they, that the film does it justice. Solomon Northup himself um, was a, a self-made man and was a violinist, I believe, in New York. But he was kidnapped and taken to the southern states where he became a slave. I mean, this could not even have occurred to him while he lived up in New York, that he would become someone's property. Now, after 12 years, Northup managed to escape and came back to the north. And of course, his story, like I said earlier, became a very key voice in the debate over slavery. Um, and he was talked of quite a lot. So to see a real perspective of someone who endured the slavery of the day, that's going to be very eye-opening. Um, and I'm really looking forward to getting into this. Um, apparently this book depicts the inhumanity, the savagery, the just callousness of conscience that was about in the minds of many of the landowners of the South. So um, yes, I'll definitely get back to you on this one. 
12 Years a Slave, Solomon Northrup. The first paragraph reads like this. Having been born a free man, and for more than 30 years enjoyed the blessings of liberty in a free state, and having at the end of that time been kidnapped and sold into slavery where I remained until happily rescued in the month of January 1853 after a bondage of 12 years, it has been suggested that an account of my life and fortunes would not be uninteresting to the public. Well, wow, talk about an understatement. So he didn't escape. He was rescued, apparently. I thought he escaped. But there you go. So, have you read this book? What did you think? My last book from this month's book haul is a book that when I did research on the most popular books in classic literature to be read, was the one that featured in most of the lists that I looked at. It featured more than all the other books that I came across, and that is Watership Down by Richard Adams. Watership Down. When Richard Adams wrote Watership Down, he was writing a children's story. However, his ambition was to write a grown-up story for children. So he wanted to introduce children to um, larger themes of the world and decided, as is quite often the case, and very effective even in, in grown-up literature, to portray a lot of things through the eyes of animals, so to anthropomorphise. In the book Watership Down, you have the start with rabbits in an ancient warren, and Fiverr has these premonitions. He's, he's, he's not the greatest rabbit, he's not strong, but he, he has these premonitions, and he senses that danger is coming, and he speaks to his brother, Hazel. Now, Hazel is a very competent rabbit, quite a strong rabbit, a natural leader, and Hazel has come to know that Fiverr's premonitions come true. So Hazel speaks to some of the other rabbits to see who wants to leave the warren with him and Fiverr. Many of the rabbits don't, but some do, and they head away. And they make their way to a place they discover called Watership Down. But it is by no means a happy ever after ending. A lot of things happen through this book, which for children would be both exciting, exhilarating, horrifying, blood curdling um, but it reveals many different emotions and another thing it shows the peculiar behaviors of humans from the eyes of the natural world and how humans dominate the natural world not always for its good anyway the first paragraph the primroses were over towards the edge of the wood where the ground became open and sloped down to an old fence and a brambly ditch beyond only a few fading patches of pale yellow still showed among the dog's mercury and oak tree roots on the other side of the fence the upper part of the field was full of rabbit holes in places the grass was gone altogether and everywhere there were clusters of dry droppings through which nothing but the ragwort would grow a hundred yards away at the bottom of the slope ran the brook no more than three feet wide, half choked with king cups, watercrests, and blue brook lime. The cart track crossed by a brick culvert and climbed the opposite slope to a five barred gate in the thorn hedge. The gate led into the lane. Isn't that just it's picaresque? It's beautiful countryside description, which you get a great deal of in this book. Um, Adam's ability to write is poetical, he's, he's, he's stunning. He's so evocative, he's so nuanced. That's a good word for Richard Adams, a very nuanced writer. So that's Watership Down, number seven of my book haul this month. Have you read any of these books yourselves? What are your opinions? Are there any in here which you've not heard of or listening to the first paragraph have really got your interest? Let's have a conversation down below, share your thoughts, and, and feel free to recommend this video to anyone else you know who loves books, and especially the classics. Until next time, I wish you joy in your reading.